All right. So, um, yes, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking today about crisis and suicide risk management. Um, and really, my goal in um, reviewing this material is to give you all a sense of, um, you know, some kind of step by step, uh, um, you know, what to do when somebody is expressing, in particular, suicidal ideation. Um, you know, some thoughts that you might go through in your mind of uh, kind of, you know, what steps are next. Um, and knowing that hospitalization is one outcome, but there are also others. Um, and so not feeling like you're on this sort of, um, you know, runaway train track to hospitalizing somebody, thinking about um, other options that are available um, and also um, steps kind of prior to getting to that highest risk level where hospitalization is needed. Um, so in that spirit, I wanted to start with just some signs to be thinking about that your client might be in crisis. Um, so, you know, certainly passive or direct statements of suicidal ideation are the ones that maybe kind of clue us in first, like somebody saying things like, you know, certainly you know, I've been thinking a lot about death and I want to die. You know, that's maybe our most straightforward one. But also, you know, people are often a little bit just less explicit in their, their discussion of these kinds of thoughts or feelings. So it might be things like, um, gosh, I'm just feeling so hopeless. It's really hard to see the point of, of living or being here anymore. Um, I know a lot of clients have, um, you know, understandably some discomfort with using some of those really direct statements of things like death. They're talking about death, for example, or dying. So they might say things like, I just, just don't want to be here. You know, these sort of open-ended, maybe not very specific thoughts. Um, but sometimes they aren't actually saying it at all. And there's more that we have to be doing to be thinking about whether this client is potentially in crisis or at risk of becoming um, in crisis. So another one that I'm often looking for is significant change in clinical status. So um, decompensation might be another term for this. You know, certainly, um, you know, sudden onset of high distress or sort of significant change in their level of distress would be one part of this. Um, but also things like, um, you know, self-care, you know, are they showering, I don't know, are they taking, feeding themselves, are they sleeping okay, um, are they missing obligations, canceling, you know, withdrawing, isolating, um, so you might be really thinking about some of those um, more kind of visible signs of clinical status. And then very importantly, um, you know, using some data to support your, your, um, your conclusions here too. So just our knowledge of individual risk factors for actual suicide attempts. So um, we know, for example, that men um, tend to attempt suicide or complete suicide at a higher rate, I should say. Um, people who own guns um, and have guns in the house, that's another major um, risk factor, especially if they have substance abuse on board too. So alcohol use in particular, we just know, you know, this is a um, substance that affects our um, inhibition and impulsivity. So um, impulsive um, self-harm or impulsive suicide attempts are really important to um, look at here. Also older age and medical problems kind of coinciding perhaps with each other here. So people who are already older, um, and again, these are all risk factors for um, uh, very serious suicide attempts or even um, completions. So older age, medical problems, chronic pain in particular is a really important one to look for. Um, of course, my little boxes, let me see if I can move this. Um, oh yes, so history of suicide attempt. Um, so anybody who's perhaps attempted before and had maybe a serious suicide attempt would be something to think about. Um, social isolation, which we were just noting, um, you know, when people are pulling away from people or just um, reporting chronic loneliness, um, that's an important risk factor. Um, insomnia is another really important risk factor. There's some interesting data even showing that um, kind of uh, sort of timing of suicide attempts or completions happening much more at night when people sort of should be asleep. Um, so insomnia is a really important risk factor. And then, of course, just their diagnosis, knowing that certain diagnoses carry more risk, major depression, chronic depression, um, 
but also we know things like um, you know borderline personality disorder, for example, and other diagnoses are certainly more associated with attempts um, and self harm more generally. So just bringing all of this in to your clinical intuition. Ultimately, this is a judgment call. Um, you know, unfortunately, perhaps, and maybe this is where a lot of the anxiety can come in for a therapist. There is no sort of threshold. Like once somebody's above a certain threshold, then you should be concerned for their safety. Um, you know, really it's hard because it's a judgment call and we have to be thinking about lots of different factors here. Um, and your own just kind of all of this impacting your gut sense for um, how this client is doing. Um, I think that this can be easier sometimes with a client that you've known longer. Um, so, you know, might just be something to think about if you're sort of newly working with somebody. Um, but also I think, you know, right now we are doing telehealth only in our practice. And that of course makes this complicated too. Um, you know, some of the sort of um, maybe difficulty reading people through the telehealth platform um, or um, just, you know, especially if you have a new client who you've only known through telehealth, um, that you might just have a little bit more trouble kind of assessing, you know, clinical status, for example. Um, which is really all the more reason to be direct in your conversations with people, which is what we will talk about now. Um, so when, well, actually, before we do, um, any questions at all about um, signs that a client might be in crisis? Any um, questions about just kind of that clinical uh, gut check, I suppose? So let's talk about talking. Um, so this can be a hard conversation to have with clients. Um, and, you know, both from the therapist side and the client side, it can be really challenging to talk openly about things like suicidal ideation. So um, this is your reminder to do just that. So, you know, if a client says something like they're feeling really hopeless and they just aren't sure if they want to be here anymore, um, you know, following up on that and asking like, okay, you know, what kinds of things come to your mind, you know, when you say don't want to be here, what do you mean? Um, asking clients to be a little bit more specific um, in what their thoughts are um, and hearing maybe what I would consider to be sort of adjacent thoughts, like maybe they're not saying that they want to die, but they're saying, you know, I'm just increasingly lonely or um, I don't think I matter to the people around me. I think I'm actually a burden on the people around me. Hopelessness in general, um, particularly hopelessness that they will maybe never feel better, they'll never get better, um, or just a, ge a general decreased sense of purpose and meaning um, when people are talking about feeling like their life has no meaning. You know, that's a very, um, you know, that's sort of this existential crisis, right? And that can kind of um, be also very related to thoughts about death. I will say, so um, I like to establish early on in a therapeutic relationship that talking about death, talking about suicidal ideation is a topic that is welcome. Um, I'll often talk about it as uh, just an expression of pain, really. Um, so this isn't, um, you know, sometimes I think as therapists, we hear something that's, you know, sort of suicidal in nature and it kind of jumps up to a certain level of like, okay, I need to do a quick, you know, risk assessment, you know, what what's your plan, what's your level of intent, of intent, you know, all this, which is important. But first, you know, I think we really have to validate and just help our clients to understand that, um, you know, this is an expression of distress. You know, when somebody is telling you that they're thinking about death, it's because they're feeling like their life is so very painful. Um, and so I'll often start with that, like, wow, okay, like things have been really, um, you know, so painful that you've been having you know, it feels like death is the only relief um, that you could possibly have. Um, sometimes clients have a lot of distress about just those thoughts themselves. Um, I would say often, actually, people don't like to feel suicidal. It's scary, maybe, or um, it makes them feel really different, um, or like they couldn't be understood by other people. It freaks out kind of the people around them. Um, so I'll often also validate that, like, okay, you know, that sounds so hard to be having these thoughts and maybe feeling like you have no one to talk to about them or that they make you different or weird. Um, 
and just reminding people that unfortunately these thoughts are common. Um, so, um, you know, having suicidal thoughts is not an unusual clinical presentation. We see it a lot. Um, and, you know, really when people are depressed or dealing with chronic emotional pain, then in some ways a suicidal thought is, is um, you know, it, it logically follows that state. You know, it's sort of an expression of just how much pain they're in. Um, so I think as just as a therapist too, it can be really important to kind of ground yourself in that. You know, we're, we often know how to validate people when they're in emotional pain and remembering this is just another expression of that. So that might be your kind of starting place. It's just really, um, you know, helping a client to feel heard, you know, that this is exactly how, how challenging their life feels right now. Um, and related to that, you know, being mindful of your own emotional response. Um, you know, we are people too, talking about death, suicide, self-injury, you know, this is often a challenging topic for people to talk about. Um, and, you know, an area that can raise a lot of anxiety. Um, you know, we know ethically, legally, empathically, we have responsibility to help our clients stay safe. Um, and so we need to, of course, assess risk. But just being aware, you know, sometimes that anxiety can lead to certainly avoidance, you know, it's our classic anxiety avoidance kind of um, pairing. So we might just not want to ask about something, even though we have a, a clinical or gut sense of like, oof, this person's really hopeless. I bet they're maybe feeling, you know, like they don't want to be here anymore. Um, but also, just um, distraction, you know, the anxiety can be distracting and particularly distracting from providing that empathic response, you know, leading with validation and really inviting a client to share more about the pain that they're in. Um, and then that last bullet point here too, you know, sometimes if your anxiety is very high, it might mean that you are taking on too much of the responsibility. Um, you know, we can't take on the responsibility of keeping a client safe all the time. You know, Many times we're seeing a client maybe one or two hours a week. Um, so, you know, that one or two hours cannot be the only thing, you know, keeping a client safe. So ideally, you'll, you're sharing that responsibility with the client and you're saying to this client, like, OK, what can I do to help you um, be safe? You know, what do you need in order to, you know, kind of be supported here? And if a client isn't able to do this or isn't willing to do that, you know, that is one of those kind of bump up in level of severity. Like if a client's unable to say um, that they want to, to try to find a way to feel better or um, that they are um, sort of open to a collaborative safety plan, you know, that's certainly a time that I would be thinking, hmm, I think, you know, higher level of care, you know, something might be um, important to think about there. I'm curious just to hear from some of you. So um, this idea of talking about suicidal ideation, um, any thoughts about this? What makes this difficult or what works well for you when you had to do this? Um, I appreciate the validation first before doing like intent attempt you know that kind of history questions because sometimes that blocks clients willingness to explore more so earlier on in training suicide risk meaning intent means you know attempt everything but it's it's more than that so i really appreciate that appreciate that like emotional validation Yeah, I think it allows it to become part of the therapy versus this like separate thing you have to address. You know, sometimes it can feel like that a little bit like, oop, someone's suicidal. I need to shift gears entirely and, you know, almost kind of disrupt the work in order to address this thought or feeling. You know, make it part of the work, make it part of that sort of um, understanding of the distress that they're in. Um, and this can be particularly important for someone with chronic suicidal ideation, you know, because then, yeah, if they're chronically suicidal, it can become very disrupting actually to therapy, to every single time you meet, have to kind of like stop, 
you know, stop therapy and do an assessment. So making it really part of um, you know, part of the work, part of their way that their distress is expressed. And maybe part of their existential crisis of, you know, do I want to be here, especially if life is indeed painful sometimes, you know, very painful. Katie. Uh, I was just going to say with chronic, with clients that experience at least passive chronically um, and sometimes active, I, I think it helps also to just consistently ask about it, even if they don't bring it up themselves. Um, so even if it hasn't changed that week, the, the fact that they know that I'm going to ask and the fact that I don't mind asking, I think makes it easier for them to bring it up when it is a more significant problem for them that week. But even if they don't feel comfortable bringing it to the table, they kind of know I'm going to check in about it. So I think it makes it easier sometimes. Yeah, and, and sort of, I mean, this might sound strange, but it almost normalizes it. And of course, you know, usually we normalize things to say like, oh, don't worry about this essentially. Um, but in this case, I think that some amount of normalizing just that like, okay, this is what pain can feel like sometimes. And, you know, that you're not afraid of that. Like, you know, that sometimes people have thoughts like this and although it's important and we need to talk about it, it doesn't have to be this sort of, you know, um, sort of five alarm fire, you know, it's, 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 um, something that you'll just yeah make a part of your work. So yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk a little bit about risk assessment because of course we do still have to do that. Um, and as we all know, there's important things to assess like, um, you know, just kind of history of um, suicidal ideation or actual kind of attempts at self-harm, um, current, plan, means, access to, um, you know, things that they could use to harm themselves, um, how far along people are in their process. So, you know, for example, if someone is actually writing notes to people or, um, you know, gathering materials, you know, that's very different than someone who says, like, I just think about death a lot and I wish I wasn't here. Um, so really, certainly you're going to want to listen for kind of um, how far along that process is. Um, so sometimes, you know, well, first off, direct, gentle, non-judgmental questioning. Um, so that's, again, you know, you've come from this place of validation that you understand that sometimes intense psychic distress leads to these kinds of thoughts. So then you're inviting your client to tell you more about what is it that they are dealing with. And sometimes even um, validating along the way, like, oh, that's so that's so hard to be kind of weighing every day, like, am I or am I not going to, um, you know, go buy that gun or, you know, whatever. Um, so really slow, you know, you don't have to rush this assessment and it doesn't have to be kind of, it is an assessment, but it doesn't have to only be an assessment. Again, you know, make this part of your work um, and your sort of validation of the experience the client is going through. Um, that said, I think it's just helpful to have your own language on hand. The more you've asked about it, the more you know how to ask about it. So questions like, you know, when were your thoughts the most intense this week? Or when, you're, when your thoughts are really intense, what kinds of things are you thinking about? Um, so just finding questions that feel good to you. Um, and really you're trying to listen for the distinction between passive ideation and active intent. You know, what is um, a passive thought, like I feel like I'll never get better or I wish I could just die, to that active intent, you know, gathering of materials or thinking out a plan, Googling online, that's a big one um, that happens a lot now, you know, people researching, um, you know, what are ways to commit suicide that are um, sort of effective. Um, so, um, Timeline, you know, kind of assessing things like that, you might, um, that might help you to determine that kind of passive versus active, knowing again that there is not a solid line here. So a lot of this is just your own kind of, um, you know, trying to, trying to kind of assess, you know, how much does this person really want to do this or plan to do this. One thing I find really challenging with this too is just impulsivity. So sometimes people aren't saying they want to do these things. And then, you know, they come to you the following week and they'll say, like, oh, yeah, 
things got really, really bad on Sunday. And I, you know, drove to that bridge and just sat there for an hour thinking about whether I should jump off of it. And you're like, oh my gosh, you know, this is so different from you know, where we were last time when we met. Um, so this is hard. You know, that's part of the challenge of being uh, a therapist for clients who have suicidal ideation is that sometimes things can be passive until they're not, you know, and suddenly they're impulsively potentially wanting to do something or that active intent builds over time. So part of this um, assessment, I think, is also a conversation with your clients about, hey, like, you know, right now this sounds like passive. You know, you're kind of saying like, you know, I'm having thoughts about death and how death would be easier, but you're not saying I'm going to go do these things to, you know, attempt suicide. Um, even just giving them a little bit of a sense of like, this is what active might feel like for you. If you feel this way, you know, here's what to do. Um, so we'll talk more about that in a moment, but, um, you know, I think it can be helpful just to actually, um, provide even a little bit of psychoeducation to clients about that distinction so that they can feel that difference internally if there's a shift. And again, just validation going a long way here. Um, you know, acknowledging that if this is a thought pattern that they're having, clearly they're in a lot of pain and in a lot of distress. Um, so just not losing that kind of anchor of, um, you know, connection really with a client that they can feel suicidal and it doesn't mean that they actually um, are rejected by people. Um, you know, that's another hard um, experience that a lot of clients have, um, you know, certainly in their personal life, but also feeling that way with therapists, like, oh, as soon as I start mentioning, you know, my thoughts about death, you know, you want to send me to the hospital. So there's that sort of um, relationship component there. And then, you know, depending on what they're saying, you can move into some safety planning. Um, so this is, you know, oftentimes we're talking to people when they're in that passive state. Um, you know, they're saying that they think a lot about death and sure they have, you know, thoughts about how they might kill, try to kill themselves, but they haven't taken any meaningful steps towards executing a plan like that. So it's really important to talk to people about what it might feel like for them if their plan is progressing or if their active intent is starting to build. Um, there's, you know, this is where kind of um, the sort of you know, maybe 10 years ago um, was very uh, sort of active in, in tra uh, training professionals to do contracting for safety. So basically saying like, please promise me that you will not commit suicide this week. You'll wait till our next session to talk about it again and reassess. Um, there's really growing evidence and just sort of theory, theory, I think, to support that this isn't necessarily the most um, effective way to um, approach suicidal ideation and safety planning. Um, for one thing, I think it puts a lot of burden on the therapist as if you need to sort of kind of procure this, this safety contract each week and you have to like re-up re it the following week. And if they don't agree to it, then what do you do? Um, so more I think about it as a collaborative plan, talking about, okay, so what is it, what is your sort of um, suicidal ideation feel like now? Um, have there been times in the past maybe where it's been stronger that can be helpful for people to sort of think about what that might feel like for them? But really just reminding people, okay, if you start really thinking about like, I need to do this, here's how I'm going to do it, that is a shift from where you are now. That would be an indicator to, in our case, refer people to call the crisis line. So between sessions, um, you know, looping in another very effective set of professionals at our main state crisis line um, to help with assessments. Um, and really between sessions, they are our best resource. Um, uh, so being main psychologists, you know, they're gonna be uh, tuned into the local resources for, um, uh, for clients in our area and what maybe needs to happen next. Um, and then, of course, that next session you can be checking into about um, kind of where their um, ideation is at. But for passive su suicidal ideation, you know, really just reviewing self-care and any other skills that work well for clients in managing their mood um, and really reminding people of the things they can do for themselves. Like, oh, you know, 
you always seem to feel better on the days you go to work. You know, even though your job's kind of a bummer, like it seems like seeing your coworkers is a real um, kind of boost to your mood. So, you know, even though it's hard to get yourself to work, go to work, you know, that might actually help you feel better. Um, discussing social support, who do they have in their lives? Um, are any of those people um, kind of trustworthy enough to share this information with? Um, that sometimes it can be really helpful to loop in, you know, maybe a partner or a close friend or a family member. Uh, again, somebody who's, um, who's trustworthy and caring, um, where the client is not necessarily unloading all of this on the person, but at least, you know, tuning them in and saying, look, I'm struggling in these ways. And sometimes it means that I, you know, I'm not sure that I want to be here anymore. And you know, really finding, again, this is sort of your sharing of your um, kind of support, that you are not the only support for this client or the only person that they can talk to about this stuff. Um, of course, sometimes you have clients who don't really have that kind of person in their life. Um, so just being aware of that too, that might not be possible for everybody. Providing the crisis service numbers in Maine, um, and really, like I said, it's kind of discussing discussing when to use that. What would be sort of some internal thresholds that they might be looking for, um, and then following up at the next session. How did this work? You know, did anything? Did you find that there were things that made you feel a little better this week? Um, things that made you feel worse. And you can do this really within whatever therapeutic modality you're using. You know, for me, it's a lot of DBT, so. You know, I'm reviewing specific skills names and making um, kind of reminders for people, you know, looking at handouts and things like, okay, you're going to need to, you know, really focus on these skills this week. Um, you know, but when I'm not working in a DBT perspective, um, you know, I can still be talking about things like self-care, um, you know, what are the ways that you, um, that you offer compassion um, and support to yourself. And then for acute intent. Um, you know, this is going to be really, you know, when people are reporting this, your sign to be considering level of care. Um, knowing that increasing level of care, as I'll talk about in a moment, doesn't necessarily mean going to the hospital, um, but it does usually warrant some kind of um, you know, thought about what your services are that you're providing. Um, and sometimes it can be really helpful to bring another professional in as you do this. So sometimes it's just, you know, consulting with in your case as residents, you know, your supervisor um, or each other or, um, or me or Julie, um, you know, kind of thinking about others that might be able to consult. Um, or you can also, especially in the moment, like as a session is happening, if you're not really sure kind of where things are at, you can actually call the main crisis line in session and say, hey, I'm here with my client, of course, with their permission. I'm here with my client, we're just trying to, you know, we need some help. We're trying to think through what some options are for this client um, and really, you know, given their level of um, suicidal ideation right now, what level of care would be most appropriate for them? Um, and so that crisis line can be a helpful resource there. We'll talk in a moment about levels of care and what things that you might think through, but any questions on, um, what I've said so far here. I guess I'm thinking about clients who um, maybe aren't acutely, um, they don't have any acute intent, intent, but you might be going through a safety plan with them because their thoughts about suicide um, have been coming up more and they express a lot of reluctance or just refuse to be willing to call the crisis line or go to crisis or emergency services, yeah. maybe based on past experiences. And again, they're not, this is more of the case that I've had where people aren't acutely suicidal, but they just, I bring it up as being an important part of the safety plan and, and yeah. they're really not wanting to hear it. Yeah. Um, I'd be interested in, in hearing how people have approached that. Yeah, does anybody have thoughts for Hillary on that? Yeah, I can share some of mine. I think, you know, this is hard. This is where, um, you know, again, even just sort of therapeutically, you don't want to be the one holding 
all of the responsibility here. And so sometimes, again, you know, there might be some way to be collaborative about this. And if it's not the crisis line, you know, do they have a trusted other person that they would call, for example? And, you know, your safety plan can include that person. And it could be that you're even inviting that person into your session to say, look, you know, my client or, you know, our person here is not comfortable um, using crisis services, but they did say that you would be someone they'd be comfortable calling. You know, here's what you might do if they call. And maybe it isn't they're the one calling the crisis line. Um, you know, I think it really, it's hard because you want, you know, you, you may need to have some boundaries around this. Like there does have to be some kind of a plan in place for you to sort of ethically um, proceed, you know, and to know that somebody has some kind of resource. So um, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm always open to thinking creatively about these things, especially if, if a client does say like, okay, you know, I always trust this person and they're always, you know, gonna sort of respond when I need them. And if they don't respond immediately or say they're, uh, you know, their phone is, you know, out of service or something, um, then in that case, I'd be willing to call 911 or something like that. Um, you know, that's fine with me. And I think that that's, you know, that might be reasonable. Um, you know, that might be another time to also just really explore what their fears are about using crisis services um, and maybe even some clarification around when they need to use it, um, especially if this is somebody who can, um, you know, who's dealing with really chronic suicidal ideation and maybe they're rather practiced at tolerating a certain amount of that, you know, they may, their threshold for what to call crisis might be higher. You know, it might be that they're really not calling unless they're having, you know, really persistent thoughts about wanting to die. Um, so, you know, that's where you can, you know, this is, there's not like a um, one plan fits everybody, you know, definitely be thinking about what might fit that particular client. Um, I hope that helps. It's a, it's a tough one. Yeah, that was helpful, especially I'm thinking of a client I recently had who kind of falls into the, the last category you spoke about. And we talked about, okay, yeah, the because I, I think some people think that the crisis hotline is you're just feeling really distressed, so you call the crisis hotline. And you're not necessarily going to get from that conversation what, you, what you're thinking you might get from it. I think some sure. clients think it's going to be like almost like a therapy session. And so I've done some psychoeducation around that kind of thing. And that's been really helpful. So yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And I think too, sometimes people also have a fear like, oh, if I reach out to a crisis service, then I will be forced into hospitalization. And that is also not typically the case. Um, we'll talk in a moment about kind of um, what it takes to hospitalize somebody is actually quite a bit, especially if it's not voluntary. Um, so sometimes people can <clears throat> feel a little bit soothed in their anxiety. Yeah, if they have a more clear idea of what this crisis service is for. Um, yeah, it's really, it's not a therapy session. It's really more of a um, kind of a resource center, I suppose. And they're certainly going to do their risk assessment as well. Let's talk about levels of care. So um, I really like to remember that there are a lot of them, you know, especially when you're dealing with um, some of those cases that are not, and they often aren't clear, like somebody really wants to, you know, is, is it sort of intent on harming themselves. Um, so when somebody is experiencing an increase in their suicidal ideation, and this is important because we know sometimes people just have a lot of chronic low levels of, of suicidal ideation. So this might not be warranted in those cases, but more like when people are sort of noticing an increase in their SI. Um, you have your own sessions that you can potentially, if, you're, if your schedule permits, increase in frequency. Um, and sometimes it's you know, even um, helpful to just do like scheduled phone check-ins. Um, so sometimes I'll do this if I don't have the time for, or maybe it's not warranted to have a whole other therapy session in a week, um, then I might say, hey, let's do a scheduled, you know, 15 minute phone conversation at this time. Um, and that, and we would really sort of specify what that's for. It is, in my case, usually it's a skills check-in. It's saying like, okay, we talked about this plan to help yourself um, kind of ride out this period of increased suicidal ideation, how's that working for you? You need to troubleshoot it a little bit. 
So oftentimes that kind of thing would be a little bit more like a focused, um, uh, not really like a deep dive into somebody's kind of levels of insight and things, but more of a, of a focused intervention. Um, or yeah, maybe having two hours a week of therapy is something that could be potentially warranted. Um, or moving up a level, some add-on service of some kind. So group therapy, um, or like even sometimes individual therapy with another therapist who's doing very focused work, like skills training, or, um, you know, sometimes we have uh, clients who might do like a particular trauma protocol with another therapist. Um, so just thinking about whether there's something like that that could be helpful. Obviously in our group, the uh, DBT skills groups that we run are a particularly kind of well-suited resource for this kind of thing. Up further, we have partial hospitalization or intensive outpatient programs. So these are going to be essentially like day treatments. So um, currently in coronavirus times, a lot of this is happening online, but it's still happening. So it might be five hours of programming a day. Um, so typically that would happen in person um, over time, I imagine that will return. Um, but this is gonna be usually a really intensive dive into a more skills focused treatment. So a lot of these programs are CBT or DBT informed or oriented, um, have a lot of group programming, which can be helpful for clients who are feeling really lonely um, and maybe like um, just don't have a lot of people who understand the kind of pain that they're in. It can be very validating in that sense. Um, and, um, you know, there's a lot of variety out there. So there's some programs locally, like I know the Maine Medical Center um, in Portland has a really um, a very nice intensive outpatient program that um, is very nicely structured, has a lot of DBT um, kind of informed services there. Um, so over time, you start to kind of notice some differences between different programs out there. Usually those um, have a wait list, as groups often do too. Um, so sometimes still there's a period of time where you're needing to really um, kind of increase your session frequency to make up for um, perhaps a wait list before somebody gets into a program. Um, so that's just good to know. Um, and oftentimes those partial programs, people will usually be in for two to four weeks or so. They are intensive in terms of hours. So if somebody's working, um, that might not work for them. Uh, so it's just important to know. Um, but they do often take insurance, which is helpful. Um, and then of course there are inpatient hospitalizations and there's lots of different kinds of inpatients um, um, inpatient programs out there, the ones we're most familiar with, of course, are going to be like your local hospital has um, its inpatient unit. Um, but there's also um, long term facilities. Those tend to be entirely self pay. Um, so it's really hard to find um, an insurance based inpatient hospitalization program that's more of like a, you know, two to four week stay. Um, inpatient stays tend to be short otherwise. So at your kind of local hospital, they're going to be a matter of maybe a couple days to a week. Um, and um, usually there's some sort of group programming, maybe some individual work happening. Um, usually in psychiatry is the biggest um, kind of access point. You know, sometimes it's hard to find um, uh, a psychiatrist. And so uh, this would be a way for people to certainly connect with psychiatry. Um, I want to just talk through some procedures here. Um, so ideally, if you're hospitalizing a client, voluntary hospitalization is always preferred. Um, you know, that's when somebody is saying, yes, I see why I need to go to the hospital right now. Um, this is just much more empowering for a client. You know, they're choosing to go. They have more um, uh, autonomy when they're there and they have the ability to choose to leave, which is all really important. Um, and it's just a le less difficult process for everybody too. You know, they're also, they, they have more freedom when they're there. Um, so what steps to what you would do? If you determine that somebody needs to go to the hospital and they're willing to go voluntarily, first step would be to send them to the emergency room. Um, so you cannot, unfortunately, um, at least around here, 
call a, a hospital and say, hey, I have somebody who I think needs to be um, admitted to your inpatient psychiatry unit. Um, can I send them to you? Um, instead, in the state of Maine, it all goes through the emergency room. So someone would go to the emergency room first, and then they would be assessed for their risk, and um, they would do a bed search. You know, sometimes they'd stay in that hospital, other times they might be sent to another hospital. Um, so what that means is that oftentimes the first maybe day, maybe two days, is spent in the emergency room. Um, so that can be really hard. It can be important to just prepare clients for that. Um, that they may be waiting around for quite a while in the emergency room before they get admitted to a unit. Um, really important to help clients make a plan for how to get to the emergency room so they can drive themselves, be dropped off by somebody or use a cab service. Um, if none of that works or there's concern about them being able to safely get themselves to the emergency room, then think about whether it makes sense to call an ambulance, although obviously that would be a very pricey way to get there. Whatever you choose, though, make that plan concretely. Um, so ideally, even in session, you know, if somebody else is going to take them, you know, maybe they um, you know, call that person in session. And then, um, and again, this is for a voluntary hospitalization. I would, the way that I proceed is I ask that person to basically tell me, okay, realistically, how long do you think it's going to take you to get there? If you leave right after our meeting, you know, maybe they want to pack a bag and um, they have to wait for you know, somebody to get home to take them. And so they're going to leave in two hours and they would be able to be there in two and a half hours. You know, estimating that reasonable window for how long it would take for them to get there and then ask them to, once they're at the hospital, contact you. Um, and, you know, it's not sufficient just for them. Usually I ask them to be on the phone with one of the providers at the hospital. So maybe the charge nurse or the admitting physician or whoever's kind of caring for them. Um, and if they don't get in touch with you by the time that you agreed on, um, you know, first I would call them and see if maybe they're just delayed for some reason. Um, but really I'd ask them, hey, if you're delayed, like you need to tell me kind of what's going on. Um, but otherwise you would do a wellness check. So you call the, their local police in their town and ask the police to go to their location to check on them. Um, this is tricky, right? Like there's, a, there's some trust here um, to really kind of, you know, hope that the client will transport themselves to the hospital. Um, but unless you have some, you know, really, really significant concern that they're going to, you know, leave your office or leave the call and, you know, go hurt themselves immediately, um, you know, this is, I think, a very kind of reasonable um, sort of, you know, uh, kind of allowance of some autonomy again, you know, that they're kind of getting themselves to the hospital. Um, but of course, if you don't hear from them in time, you would have to follow through on that plan to call the local police um, and um, have them do a wellness check. So in a wellness check, the police would go out to whatever address you give them to check on the person, um, and they can't leave until they have actually checked on that person. Um, so it's, it can be um, helpful, but also intense. So you, know, you try not to do that. That's why you know, you're hopefully getting all these communications in, in line with the client. This differs from an involuntary admission where, you know, in this case, you are basically saying you need to go to the hospital, the client is refusing. Um, in that case, you're going to have to involve either um, a mobile crisis unit through the main crisis line, which I think is really the best sort of resource as, um, for us as therapists. Um, or you would have to contact their local police. Um, but really the main crisis line is kind of best suited for this sort of situation. Um, so making sure you have the accurate address for the client um, and then kind of deploying, calling the main crisis line saying that, you know, explaining the situ situation and asking them to help you to get a mobile crisis unit out to the client. In which case that unit would then kind of take over um, you know, um, getting the client to a hospital. Um, there's a lot of paperwork that then you have to complete, and I'm not going to go through all of that today. Hopefully, you won't have to deal with involuntary uh, hospitalizations all that much, but basically, there's this blue form that you have to complete for the initial um, hold of a client, um, and it has to be reviewed by a judge who will then kind of determine whether the person um, should, or sort of their 
level of risk warrants an involuntary hold. Um, and then you have to do this white paper basically to sort of hold them longer. So um, with this though, you're now, as I say on the slide, you're part of a, a team. You know, they're at a hospital, you know, for their sort of crisis services, getting them to the hospital. There are other people who are then completing their own risk assessments. Um, you're still probably a lead part of this team since you're the initial referring therapist, um, but, but you're also going to have the benefit of some other people to talk to you about, you know, what seems to be the level of risk for this client. In case of, of involuntary hospitalization, I would say definitely um, sort of um, talk to consult, you know, talk to lots of people um, as you're going through this. I know we're getting towards the end of our time, so I wanted to just briefly remind everybody that all of this has to be carefully documented um, in the ele electronic health record, knowing that this kind of record particularly might be read by any sort of person um, out there. So just being thoughtful in your level of detail and the language that you use. Um, and also thinking about, are there any other providers in particular, you know, maybe their psychiatrist, for example, who needs to know about this hospitalization um, and your own, um, you know, your own supervisor in the case um, of being an unlicensed um, therapist. So just making sure you're kind of looping everybody in. Um, this information, State of Maine Resources, this is in a document for all of you on the postdoc website. So um, it's all there. Um, but I like to just highlight, so the crisis line is great, open all the time. The warm line is a peer-to-peer -peer service. This can be helpful for if you have like a high user of crisis services, who's maybe more in like a chronically passive state of suicidal ideation. Um, you might think about using the warm line instead. Um, and then of course, you know, urgent emergency, you know, somebody's overdosing in your office, 911, you know, don't, um, don't delay. Um, and I know that there's more that we could talk about with this, but I hope this at least gives you kind of an initial um, sort of like decision tree and some steps to go through. Um, we'll leave it there for today, um, but this is something we can absolutely revisit and all of your supervisors, you know, have um, this kind of sort of decision tree to go through as well. So definitely um, use them as resources too. But thank you, everybody. Um, and yes, it's one o'clock, so we must go. <laughs> so um, if you have any additional questions, please just feel free to actually, even like the consultation room that Julie set up um, through GSP 